uh, start with today's session, the first topic being the basics of fever. As said by the famous virology professor, Dr. C. George Ray, fever is your friend. Uh, that might sound a very uh, uh, cure uh, uh, statement because always uh, as pediatricians, we uh, try to actually bring down fever in whatever way we can. Parents are really concerned if the child is having a, a, a slightly raised temperature and uh, they might even look beyond the other discomfort the child has and they only problem might be the fever as such. And we as pediatricians actually pursue uh, whatever we can to uh, bring down the fever in a child. But actually, is fever a friend or a foe? We'll go and see in the coming slides. As we all know, fever is defined as a temperature, as a rectal temperature more than or equal to 38 degrees Celsius or 104 degree Fahrenheit. And any temperature about 100 degree Fahrenheit and any temperature about 104 is taken as hyperparexia. And as we all know, fever is a symptom and not a disease per se. It is just a symptom of some underlying condition. It may be an indicator of an infection or an inflammation. So it does not point to any particular disease as such. And most of the time it is harmless. It is just a symptom, uh, just telling you that there is some problem happening in the child. But at times it might be a sign, a red flag sign that a serious problem is occurring in your patient. Now, how do we measure temperature? We all know measuring temperature is one of the basics that we learn in our medical school. Uh, we uh, usually use a mercury thermometer or nowadays you have the digital thermometer, which is quite easy to use and you can actually uh, train your parents to do the same. And in the COVID times, we have seen the IR thermometers or the, uh, the thermal scans that uh, we have at many places. So most commonly the axillary temperature is used in uh, routine practice, though the definitions usually talk in terms of the rectal temperature. But the problem with rectal temperature is you need spe uh, specific thermometers for the same and it is a cumbersome and a slightly discomforting uh, procedure for the child. Tympanic thermometers are very good indicators of the core temperature of the body because uh, it uh, actually reflects the temperature of the blood surrounding the hypothalamus. And now uh, the non-contact digital IR thermometers are the fashion. Now it is not a single reading that counts. It is a serial monitoring of the temperature of the child that actually matters in the management of a particular patient. Now just rushing through the mechanism of fever, as we all know, there are three mechanisms of fever. One, there is a difference in the set threshold for fever or, or the body temperature in the hypothalamus, which is produced by the exogenes and endogenes pyro pyrogens. Then there can be an increased heat production, which may out, uh, you know, uh, actually go beyond the uh, heat loss the body has. And third thing, there is a defective heat loss. So there's an increased production, there is a decreased loss or a difference in the center, where the, which is the hypothalamus, where there's a decrease or a, a difference in the set threshold. So usually the hypothalamic threshold is managed by the interleukins, the cytokines, the prostaglandins, so, uh, specifically the prostaglandin PGE2, which, is a, uh, which binds to the prostaglandin receptors in the hypothalamus and changes the threshold causing fever. It can be induced by endogenous pyrogens, which are formed inside the body as a reaction to your infection or inflammation, or it can be due to an exogenous pyrogen. That is something, a toxin or an endotoxin produced by your micro. The second one, heat production, which exceeds the heat loss, which is seen in conditions like malignant hyperthermia, drug poisoning, especially the salicylate poisonings. And a defective heat loss where actually the child cannot let out heat, which is seen in a heat, a heat exposures when the child is exposed to uh, excessive heat, especially in the summer months or in ectodermal dysplasia where there are no sweat glands and the sweating mechanism does not help in the dissipation of heat. Now, the mechanism, uh, whatever we mentioned in the earlier slides, it can be in endogenous pyrogens, it can be exogenous pyrogens, which changes the hypothalamic threshold or it can be a decreased product, an increased production or a decreased heat loss that can occur and causing fever. Now, cytokines, these are the endogenous pyrogens that, uh, that causes fever, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, the main, which is the IL-1 and IL-6. IL-6 is in the news nowadays because IL-6 is a marker, which is a favorite of the, uh, co in COVID management. Then you have the other cytokines like, like the tumor necrosis factor alpha, the INF alpha, mm -hmm the GMCSF and others, and complements the lymphocyte producing lipids, all of these form endogenous pyrogens. 
the anti-inflammatory cytokines actually help decrease inflammation in the body. And as we know, the IL-1, IL-10, IL-4 are the anti-inflammatory cytokines there. Now, pyrexia or fever is something more than uh, a rectal temperature more than or equal to 38 degree Celsius or 100.4 degree Fahrenheit. Now, what is hyperpyrexia or hyperthermia? Hyperpyrexia or hyperthermia is, hyperthermia is a fever which is more than 41.5 degree Celsius or 106.7 degree Fahrenheit. That is the body is heated to an extent that the body is unable to bring down the temperature uh, as such. Here, the difference between fever and hyperthermia is that there is no hypothalamus involved in the hyperthermia part. In fever, what happens? The hypothalamic threshold is changed. The set point of the hypothalamus is changed. But in hyperthermia, nothing of that sort ha is happening. The hypothalamic thermoregulatory center, in fact, in fact, is intact. But what happens is either there is an excessive production of heat or there is a defective loss of heat. The skin becomes hot and dry. And because our antipyretics, most of the antipyretics act through the prostaglandin, decreasing the prostaglandin and decreasing this uh, threshold, the thermo acts on the thermoregulatory center. But here, because the thermoregulatory center is not affected, there is no role of any antipyretic here. And the only thing that can help here is bringing down the temperature by sponging or unbundling and all such measures. So this is what we uh, talked in the previous slides, fever, here, there are cytokines involved, the hypothalamus is involved. In hyperthermia or hyperparexia, there is no hypothalamus involved. It is either the increased production or the decreased loss that is uh, happening. Now, what are the causes of hyperthermia? The classical causes of hyperthermia is a heat stroke that is very common in South India, especially in the summer months, people working outside, children playing outside, going to a... a, a fair where uh, you know the children uh, there is a, a, a bright sun it's very sunny and the ch child actually loses uh, water he becomes uh, overheated and uh, causes a heat stroke then you have endocrinopathies in the form of thyrotoxicosis and fear chromocytoma where the basic metabolic rate is uh, you know goes up uh, by many folds and there is an increased heat production occurring there CNS damage, especially the classic pontine damage that we uh, always learn in our med school uh, as a cause for hyperthermia or a hypothalamic injury can also lead to hyperthermia in a child. Malignant hyperthermia, which is a result of drugs such as succinylcholine or the inhalational anesthetic drugs that we use in practice. And there can be drug induced uh, uh, or increased production of heat as in salicylate poisoning or anticholinergic poisoning. Now, now, after we have said all this, we are, if you remember the first statement that uh, Dr. George Ray said, is fever really a friend? That, that, uh, the answer to that is clear in these slides. What does fever actually do? Fever increases the WBC production and migration to the site of injury. There is a decreased endotoxin production. So uh, this is very clear. It is very clear from this slide that all these are beneficial to the body, right? You're decreasing the endotoxic production is beneficial. Neutrophils are a first line of attack. Increasing their production is beneficial. Activation of the B cells and T cells is again beneficial in boarding of an infection. Enhance phagocytosis, enhance complement fixation. So fever actually helps and boosts our immune system to tackle the infection or inflammation that is happening in our body. So fever is actually a friend, but all of us actually see it as a foe. That is what I would like to bring out from this presentation. Fever is a beneficial immune response. Now, should fever ever be of concern? All that said, fever is always our friend, but should we ever be wary of a fever? Yes, you should. You should be concerned if there is a fever in a newborn or a baby less than three months of age because it may indicate a systemic bacterial infection in that child. Fever in a child with a past history of febrile convulsions because that can precipitate a febrile seizure in that child. Fever in a malnourished child may be an indicator of a severe underlying disease that the child may have because a malnourished child, an immunocompromised child may not bring out, may first, in the first place, they not, may not mount a high fever. They may even present with hypothermia. And also it might indicate a sinister infection that is underlying in this child. Fever in a child with chronic disease. And again, fever that lasts more than one week or should always raise your brows because that can be a chronic infection. It can be an inflammation. There can be some underlying cause that is happening there. And we'll go through these in the coming topics. And fever associated with weight loss because weight loss is again a red flag sign in a child who has fever. Now, the general considerations in any case of fever. How do you approach a child with fever? The first approach will always be the history. 
So you'll be taking a history about whether it is a acute onset fever or is it insidious onset? What is the duration of fever? How is the uh, pattern of fever? That is the key point. The pattern of fever is very important. It is not a single point of time or a single temperature according that actually matters. Sometimes you may find parents coming to your OP telling that, you know, ma uh, madam or sir, my child had a high fever yesterday. We didn't record a temperature actually. My high fever may not be the parent's high fever. So unless you have a clear recording that to a trend of the fever, you may not be able to actually diagnose what the illness is. So then the next thing you have to know the age of the child. As I told a newborn or a child less than three months, you should be always uh, on your guard. A child with comorbidities or a chi immunocompromised child is a high risk child where you have to be careful. You should ask about history of past history of vaccination because two things, one, if the child is unvaccinated, there are many diseases that come into your DDs. And if the child had, has, has had a recent vaccination, which can precipitate a fever, that might be the only cause of fever. The epidemiology that is very pertinent and relevant in today's time when any child presenting with fever, we may have to do a COVID test to see if the child really has a COVID. Uh, 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 a child presenting with fever when there is an outbreak of dengue fever or a leptospirosis, you may have to think of that difficult diagnosis in your mind. Then you do your clinical examination of which the first, as we all know, is a triage where you actually see if the child is a sick child or a well child. A sick child, your, uh, your uh, onus is on stabilizing the child and then giving the appropriate treatment and then only you start you know, actually investigating. But if it's a well child, you may actually go start investigating if needed, if at all it is needed, and then decide on your treatment. You may have to look for some areas that you usually may overlook in your clinical examination, such as the joints, the spine, the bones, the ear. You know, uh, it's, it's not very common for us pediatricians to go and look at the ear. We might not, but it might be just an ASOM that might be cause, the cause of fever in the child. And then you go and do the appropriate investigations if necessary. Now, documentation, documentation, documentation. This is the key word in diagnosis uh, or in uh, helping. You know, if fever has to help you with the diagnosis of an illness, documentation is the key word there. A serial recording, because we, we know the classical teaching of the uh, called, uh, the tertian uh, fever or the uh, biphasic fever, which you see in dengue, the tertian fever that you see in malaria. All this you can interpret only if you have a recording you have you should have a temperature chart where you should record the temperature even before you give antipyretics to the child and you should look at the interfebrile period how is a child in the interfebrile period a child with a high grade fever but as soon as you give an antipyretic he his fever comes down he's playful he's active he's running about and he then becomes sick sick only after four or five hours when he gets the next spike of fever that is a child where you can be a bit more safe with because that is a child who is active and you are more uh, you are relieved that you are not dealing with a very sick child but if the child remains to be inactive or dull or drowsy in the interfebrile period you should be on your guard that is a sick child you are having and you should be very uh, serious and you should uh, actually go about with that child with utmost care you look for the vitals, if there are any derangement of your vitals. Sometimes you get a tachycardia, which is not corresponding to your degree of fear. We know that with every degree Celsius raise of fever, you have a 10 beats increase of heart rate. But if the heart rate is not corresponding to that, it's even more. You may have to suspect myocarditis or impending shock in that child, uh, according to the situation. Then you look for associated signs and symptoms, which may help to point to many differential diagnoses. So how can you reach a deep clinical diagnosis? We told you analysis of the onset of the symptom and the progress of the symptom along with the uh, fever chart is very important. Now, the most common illnesses that we see in office practice, the most, uh, the very common viral illnesses, then you have the bacterial uh, infections, then you have uh, in uh, uh, most uh, of the South Indian states, malaria is endemic, then you have the less common immune mediated fevers. Now, bacterial infections can be a bacteremia or it can be a point of entry infection. That is, you have a wound, there is an infection there, or you have a, 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 a ear infection where, where there is no bacteremia. So, how do you differentiate between these? Actually, it's not, uh, it is not an all or none phenomena. You, it's just corroboratory evidence to help you differentiate. If the at the at onset, if the degree of fever is really high, you may have to think of a viral infection, 
um, uh, sometimes malaria and bacterial infection at the site of injury. Whereas if there is a systemic bacterial infection or a chronic infection, usually it is a low grade fever that occurs first and in the uh, progression, it may turn out to be a high grade fever. The second aspect is a response to your antipyretic and the antipyretic of choice is always paracetamol. How does a child respond to paracetamol? Suppose if, it is, if, if the child has a good response to paracetamol, we may consider, it is not, uh, we should, we may consider it to be a bacterial infection, uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, a viral infection. If it's a poor response, you may have to consider a non-viral infection. And it's, Hello, sir. And the interfebrile period, if the child continues to be sick in the interfebrile period, that child is a very sick child. We have to care, be careful with that child. And this, it's probable that the child has a bacterial infection. The fourth question will be the rhythm of the fever. Okay, is it a remittent fever? It is, a, is it a continuous fever or is it a relapsing fever? What is the trend of fever? Because if you have a rhythmic fever like a tertian fever, it may point to a Quivax malaria. If it's an erratic fever, it can be any, anything. It, can, it could be a viral infection. If there is a periodicity, it could be a periodic fever. It comes under the auto-inflammatory uh, diseases, a periodic fever. Then look for the trend. What happens after 72 hours? That, that is when actually you start investigating a child with fever if there are no other uh, localizing signs. So if there is a worsening of the child by 48 to 72 hours, you may have to think of a bacterial infection. But in usual, the common viral infections, the child usually improves by three to four days of fever. If the child is remaining same, it could be an immune-mediated fever or something like malaria, which takes some more time for the child to develop unless you uh, start treating the child. Then you ask for any accompanying symptoms. The sixth question will be your accompanying symptoms. That will help localize. If there is an ear pain, you may localize. If there is a sore throat, you may, it may help you to localize. If there is dysuria, UTI is one of the commonly missed uh, reasons for a fever. If there is dysuria or sometimes a child may not present it with dysuria at all. So, uh, so these are the, you look for any accompanying symptoms. Now, broadly, I've, we have divided this into four. If this is a generalized viral infection, what are the clues that you may get to tell that this child, this child has a fever because of a generalized viral infection? If there are two or more mucous membranes involved, suppose the child has conjunctivitis, there is a red buccal mucosa, if there is a, a coryza, and history of similar illness in the family, there are other family members with URI or fever or rash, okay? So that may point to a viral infection. What points, if there are localizing signs, suppose there is a sore throat, there are swollen uh, tonsils, if there is ear pain, if there is a huge lymph node there, that may point to a bacterial infection at the point of entry. So it is not, it's not a bacteremia that you have, it's at the point of entry bacterial infection. If there is a systemic bacterial infection, if there is bacteremia, the child may be more sick. The child may have complications. Uh, if suppose the child has pneumonia, the child will be breathless. There be, they might be meningeal signs and meningitis. If there is an abdomen, if there is an abscess elsewhere inside the body, the child may be looking septic, toxic. The child may be very sick. And immune mediated uh, or malignancy related or auto inflammatory related fevers are a small group that we have but we should be very concerned you, they may have a prolonged fever which may or may not respond to your antipyretics and you may have other features like such as arthritis arthralgia an evanescent rash at the time of fever there might be oral painless ulcers there can be bone pain bone tenderness bleeding manifestations all these are red flag signs and then uh, they may indicate to the uh, the unusual causes of fever such as auto inflammatory or autoimmune or malignancy that causes fever now let us look at the red flag signs of fever. We follow the acronym ABC. A is for the arousal or the alertness or the activity. If it's a very active alert child, you need not you need not be uh, you know uh, on your guard at that point of time. But if it's a sick, drowsy child, even with uh, a low grade fever, you should be very careful. What is B? B is a breathless child. If the child has breathing difficulties, yes, this child is having a systemic bacterial infection. You should be careful in uh, managing that child. If they look for the color or the cry of the child, a child who is pink and has a good cry and who is interacting is a okay child. You can actually uh, maybe postpone your investigations or maybe just give an antipyretic and treat the child. But if the child is mortal, if the child is pale, if he's weak, 
these are is a weak cry you should be very careful you may have to actually speed up your investigations and your treatment and look for the uh, the d is the decreased urine output and the decreased in fluid intake the input and output decreased input and output these are red flag signs that a child can have if the child is not able to drink or the child has a decreased urine output that means that child is that sick he is not able to even do it for he himself or he is not able to accept his intake so a change in the look or activity of the child should be the prime uh, red flag that you should be looking for when the child comes to you rather than the degree of fever a child may have a degree of uh, one or two we, we, we see parents coming into the ed telling that this my child is one or three degree uh, fahrenheit temperature doctor do something no we need, if the child is playful child is looking at you playful he is pulling out your stethoscope and your coat and he is smiling at you you needn't be worried but at the same time the child coming in within a uh, 100 degree fahrenheit but the child is looking sick he is drowsy that is a child that should be very aggressive with now which knee uh, cases these are the cases we mentioned earlier any febrile neonate any infant less than 3 months immuno compromised child child with chronic illnesses if there is an unexplained death in the family with similar illness so that is a fatal suppose you have a uh, and in, in nowadays when you have covid if there is a contact with a covid suspect or a covid case you should be very careful now how to manage the child the antipyretic of choice is paracetamol uh the, the, we tend to use uh, nsaids nsaids especially in this covid era is a big no you should refrain from using nsaids and paracetamol is a drug of choice for antipyrexia and uh, paracetamol uh, can be given as actually not to bring down the fever as a symptom it is actually for the comfort of the child uh, according to nelson uh, if the temperature is below 9 uh, 99 or below there is no need to give anything that is what they say because it is just to make the child comfortable the second so the, there is no fixed drug combination such as paracetamol and mefenetic acid some combinations that we find in the market that is a big no adequate fluids and electrolytes especially in viral infection you should make sure that the child is taking adequate fluids the child should be hydrated child should have an electrolyte balance proper nutrition we tend to sometimes you know come down on the nutrition when the child is sick just restricted restraining to uh, or rice gruel or uh, rusk so that is not the way the child should continue maybe take a extra meal when uh, he is actually uh, having an illness proper rest adequate rest is needed unbundling that is what uh, when there is a increase heat production child is in the heat when there is hypothermia just you know uh, removing his clothes may actually help dissipating the heat and bringing down the temperature all of us right from our childhood you know when there is a fever first thing our mother brings to us is a sweater so and we you know we are all bundled up in warm clothes but that might actually bring up your temperature there and cause more uncomfortable feel, feeling to the child so in hypothermia you can do uh, tepid sponging you can um, uh, put on the fan or the ac trying to bring down the temperature and tepid sponging is something that we usually use in any case of fever but most of the times we see that the children once the moment the uh, cloth touches the body the child starts crying so instead of making the child more comfortable we are making the child more uncomfortable and in fever per se tepid sponging may not have such a role if the if you are making the child uncomfortable so tepid sponging is the treatment of choice only for heat stroke and hypothermia where you want to bring down the heat when there is an increased heat production and you want to dissipate the heat now we'll go to this case of a 3 year old child who was brought in the month of may so may is a key point there because summer it's summer in india in may and who was to oh, who was going to an open fun fair again he is exposed to heat at 1 o'clock the prime times so this question has all the keywords for a uh increase heat production there so he has brought with a high temperature of 106 so this is a case of hypothermia this is not fever it's hypothermia because he was exposed to the sun so what would be our choice here our choice would be just external cooling and fanning because we told there is no hypothalamus involved here if there is no hypothalamus involved there is no role of any antipyretics here so now we'll go to a few terms uh, that that we can uh, that you will be uh, finding in the coming presentations fever without focus fever without focus is a, a, a child with a fever more than 100.4 degree fahrenheit where the fever is the only presenting symptom and he has no other clinical signs so you cannot actually localize where the uh, where the cause of fever is so that is fever without focus fever of unknown origin it's a single illness in which fever 
cannot uh, uh, fever is present for more than two weeks but you cannot have a diagnosis of after two weeks of op diagnosis or after one week of hospitalization where you have done all your laboratory investigation so if there is no focus after two weeks of op uh, invest uh, op uh, visit and after one week of uh, ip inpatient evaluation and lab evaluation if you don't get a focus it is fever of unknown origin and fever should be documented at least one spike per day for more than or equal to 8 days recurrent fever is usually a sequential self limited fever it can be due to uh, infection of a single system or due to multiple system involvement you know the child is having recurrent episodes of fever and periodic fever is when you can actually predict the when the child is going to have a fever okay today uh, the child is having fever after 3 weeks the parents might be able to see he is going to have fever so that is periodic fever and it is a it is a uh, it, it is something that points to your auto inflammatory periodic fever syndromes like your familia mediterranea in fevers now coming to the key message of my talk fever is a friend and not a foe please do not try to fight with fever and try all your uh, all the weapons in your armamentarium to bring down fever because it is actually a friend and uh, the, the the goal of managing fever is to make the child comfortable so please do not do aggressive sponging and make the child aggressive and start crying because that is not going to help history is very important you should know what your patient what comorbidity your patient has what is the history what is the onset the trend of fever and you should look for clinical clues that the child has that can point your diagnosis treat the patient not the number on your thermometer please do not look at the number on a thermometer look at the patient if the if the child may be in hypothermia but he might be having a serious infection child might have a temperature of 1 or 3 but he might be playful he might be playing with you so that is not a sick child so treat the patient serial documentation is very important we should make it a habit to serially document fever if suppose you cannot have the child as an inpatient you can actually advise your parents to buy a digital thermometer and record because many a times you have seen it is just the uh, normal temperature that the parents or the mother interpret as a abnormal uh, fever and you might actually go uh, doing unnecessary investigations and unnecessary treatment for the child paracetamol is only for the treatment of the child it is not uh, fever is not a disease where paracetamol is the drug and every fever case is not an indication for an antibiotic most of us uh, tend to write an antibiotic either to fulfill the wish of the parent or because we feel okay once i have given an antibiotic i am safe so that is not the go antibiotic resistance is on the high every fever case is not an indication of antibiotic you should actually follow up the case see if the child requires empiric antibiotics or not thank you so much uh, and i will be happy to take any